You may have noticed that sometimes when I'm working with digital logic, I'll be using a 7 volt supply instead of a 5 volt like you'd expect. That's because I'm using an op amp that doesn't go to the rail, and for that particular circuit I need it to go to the rail. Or at least reproduce signals at the rail. And that's fine and dandy, except it's much easier to have a 5 volt supply than a 7. And not all of my chips can handle 7 volts, and then you have to adjust outputs to a 5 volt device, and it's really gotten annoying. So I looked around for another solution, and as it turns out, I was apparently being silly, because I can just turn the voltage up without changing the supply. I need more, just have more. But I suppose it's not that easy. When you use a voltage doubler like this, it's for signal, not power. It becomes unstable and in fact can't actually double the voltage if you draw too much current. So it's great for an op amp, it's not great for trying to power a device. You're not going to use a 5 volt supply to power a 12 volt fan using this method. That's what transformers are for. And in fact there is an AC version of this circuit, which I will show you in the future. But for right now, all we need is a timer. Let's have a single sided supply. We'll make it 5 volts. Let's have a 555 timer. Let's power the chip. We don't need reset so we'll tie it high. Optional step, put a capacitor between VCC and ground so that the chip has a more stable power supply. I didn't bother for my example. Other optional step put a capacitor to ground, series capacitor to ground, on the comp pin for extra stability in the chip, in the reference voltage used by the chip. I also didn't bother for this example. First we're going to turn it into a square wave generator. Nothing new or special here. The example of this circuit I found on the internet used 100 nanofarads for the capacitor, 10 kilo ohms for this one, and 33 k ohms for that one. Hook it up to the discharge pin, we tie threshold and trigger together to the top of the capacitor, and now we have our square wave generator. The discharge pin is the open collector one that alternately is high impedance or a short to ground. So when discharge is open, the capacitor discharges, hence the name, into the discharge pin, which drops the capacitor's voltage and makes threshold and trigger go low, and then as the flip-flop of the timer switches, discharge will close and the capacitor will charge back up through the resistors until it goes high and it repeats the cycle, square wave. Not 50% duty cycle, but we don't care. It's close enough. So that's just the square wave generator. You could technically use any square wave generator, but this is incredibly cheap and easy. Now for the fun part. I forget if I already mentioned it, but just in case, there is a version of this that's designed to come after a transformer that takes a regular sinusoidal AC voltage and rectifies it and doubles it that way. Again, for signal, not for power. For power, you need the transformer to do it. But I'll go over the AC version another time. This one uses the square wave, and thus doesn't need any transformer at all. Pretty much every voltage doubler design you'll see uses two diodes and two capacitors. The example I found on the internet used 1N4007 diodes. I'm using 1N4148. It doesn't matter that much. None of these part choices matter that much for rough circuitry. You know, you just have to use parts that get the job done. The example recommended 47 microfarads here, but I didn't have one that big, so I did 4.7 microfarads. They suggested 470 microfarads here, but I used another 4.7 microfarads. If you can go with bigger ones, you want this one to be a bit bigger and this one to be definitely bigger. Not huge, but bigger. But this is at least functional to show you that it works. So the square wave generator is putting out a high-low, high-low, high-low signal on output. And just to make it a little more clear, let me separate this off. This is the square wave generator, and this is the doubler. So here's where the magic happens. Let's say that the output is currently low. So let's say we have a low here. We've got the supply here, 5 volts, going through a diode, charging this capacitor. So this capacitor charges into the chip up to the supply voltage. So you know, 5 volts minus the drop and so forth. Down here we've got another diode. I made a small mistake. The load is connected across this capacitor, not between the diodes. This is the circuit. I just put the wire in the wrong place. So anyway, the capacitor is charging, and then the power is going through this other diode, 
It's going through the load, so the load is seeing the 5 volt supply voltage, and it's also charging this capacitor to the supply voltage. So if you were to leave it this way, this capacitor would charge to the supply and stop, this one would charge to the supply and stop, and the load would be seeing the supply not doubled. But that's just step one, because step two, this is a square wave, and then the output goes high. So the capacitor is charged and trying to be a power supply going to the right. The voltage has risen on this side, so it wants to discharge, so it begins pushing this way. So now you've got the supply coming through this diode and you've got the capacitor both pushing into this spot. And this is the secret, this is why we need capacitors, because we need separate EMFs, electromotive forces, in other words, power supplies. Because if you just take a 5 volt power supply and you hook two wires into a spot, that's just two wires. It's not a separate electromotive force, it's not pushing twice as hard because you've got two wires. But by forcing charge into the capacitor and then letting go, it'll push it back out as a separate electromotive force, so at this spot you get supply plus capacitor, and so doubled, not completely, but basically doubled, because you get the voltage drop off of the diode and such. And so there's where your diode choice matters, and the frequency of the capacitor and the load and everything matter. For best performance, you want diodes that can handle a large reverse voltage, but have a small voltage drop. You know, just pick a good part. So we've got the power going through this diode, and the capacitor discharging. Now we've got higher than supply going through this diode, higher than supply going through this load, and this capacitor now is being charged to greater than the supply. It was already charged to the supply, now it's being charged higher because this capacitor is pushing through. And then the output goes low again, and just like before, power goes through the diode, the capacitor is charging back up, so it's no longer pushing and adding to the voltage, so this voltage is no longer doubled. In fact, it's lower because the capacitor is sucking some. And then the supply is pushing through, but here's the magic. The capacitor is charged to a higher voltage than is trying to come through here. The capacitor discharges through the load. So the supply might be five volts. You might have like three or three and a half or something. If you have huge diodes, let's just say four. Let's say half a volt for each diode. So five volts becomes four after two diodes. But this might have been charged to eight. So now it's discharging to continue to supply the load with the doubled voltage. And this supply is helping supplement the current, so it's reducing the rate that this discharges, but it's still discharging. And then the output goes high again. This capacitor resumes doubling the voltage. This capacitor begins to charge back up as the full voltage coming through here is supplying the load. And your switching frequency just must be such that it never gets too low. And this is why the load matters. This is why I say it's for signal, not for power. Load should be high impedance. It doesn't have to be giga ohms, but it should be reasonably high impedance. Because the more current going through the load, the faster this capacitor is going to discharge when this capacitor is charging. On the cycle, the low cycle, that half wave, when this capacitor is charging, when this output is low, this capacitor is discharging. If your load is too high, it's going to drain and the voltage is going to drop. But that is the magic. We use a capacitor to create a new electromotive force to give us an extra push, and then we bank it for future need. And that's why it needs the alternating voltage. It needs the square wave. I've looked around for a version that doesn't need AC of any kind, because this is AC. It's a square, square wave is AC. I haven't found one. It may exist still. I haven't read the entire internet, but pretty much all of them do need at least AC input from a transformer or a square wave or something similar, because we have to use the capacitor. We have to charge it and then let it discharge, and to do that we need the alternation of voltage. But it's a pretty neat trick, isn't it? Whatever your square wave source, it doesn't have to be this, just any square wave source, all you need is two diodes and two capacitors. Ideally bigger than this. 47 microfarad, 470 microfarad is probably good, according to the example I saw. But two diodes, two capacitors, and you can double your voltage. 
change. Can you double it more? Can you triple it, quadruple it? You can make it over a hundred times bigger. Every time you make it bigger, though, the bigger your load has to be, the higher impedance. Pretty much at that point you are using gigohms, or else you are using a massive power source and massive parts, which is a thing. But for today, I think we'll just stick to doubling. Let me show you. Five volt supply, square wave provided by any 555 10K and 33K resistors, 100 nanofarad capacitor, and then the voltage doubler is just two 1N4148 signal diodes and two 4.7 microfarad capacitors, just like I showed you on the board. I'm starting with my oscilloscope because I did mention that the size of the load, the impedance of the load, affects the final voltage, because more load drops the voltage because the capacitor can't stay as high. My multimeter has a 1 mega ohm impedance, the oscilloscope probe has a 10 mega ohm impedance, and I've also got a 50k ohm potentiometer to show off. Right now only the oscilloscope is connected, and here in the middle, I'll use this to point. Here's my zero line. Let's see what the voltage is. If I use the dial to put the voltage line on one of the grid lines, it's reading at about 8.8 .8 volts with a 5 volt supply. And it's a nice line too. If I zoom in, freeze it, you can see it's, it's a nice line. Because I have such a stable load and the capacitors are big enough for such a tiny load. So there you go. If you're not trying to demand a lot from this, you don't need crazy parts. Though the capacitors could still use to be a bit bigger, especially if you have noise. This is more quiet than some power sources would be. So now let me bring the line up a bit because I want to show you when I turn on the multimeter and I plug it in to measure. Carefully watch the line. As I plug it in, you'll see the line go down a very small amount. Did you see that? It went back up and now I'll plug it in again and the line goes down because I've now plugged in a one mega ohm impedance, parallel resistance, so there's more current, which means the voltage dropped. So instead of 8.8 .8 some, we're getting 8.46. Still a nice line though, but 8.46. Now I'm gonna plug in the 50K ohm potentiometer and right now it's turned all the way up so it should be about 50K. Now we're down to about 7.52. And you can see there's a little more noise, hopefully you can see, that it's wiggling a bit because it's discharging more between charging. It's, 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 there's more ripple, essentially. There's more of a wave. If I freeze, it really doesn't look that bad. And honestly, it's not that bad. And see the wiggle here, it's wiggling a little bit as it's measuring. So it's noisy, but it's fine. But because much more current is going through than before, the capacitor is dipping further and charging back up and dipping further and charging back up. If I unplug, you can see that it sits nice and calm and not a wiggly line. But let's plug it back in. So now I'm going to drop the resistance. So as I turn it down, you should see the voltage, 7.46, 7.40, the voltage is dropping and dropping. The noise is increasing. Well, don't unplug it, there. The noise is increasing, the voltage is dropping. As I'm giving it more and more of a load to power, if I go down to let's say 6.65 volts, you can really see the noise now, and now it looks like you can you can see the charging curve. You see it goes boop and charges and and boop and that's the charging curve. And if I turn it down even more, I can turn it down and down and down, and now we're barely doubling, basically not doubling at all. You can really see the charging curve now. Let's spread it out a bit so you can see it drains, charges real fast because there's there's no resistance charging the capacitor back up, the, the, the one that's holding double that's on the load, it's positive through diode, diode, capacitor, no resistance basically, and then the other capacitor through diode and capacitor. So there's only the minimal resistance of the wires, so it charges super fast. And then it's going through the load, and the load is getting smaller and smaller, but it's still, you know, well, it, it's still in the hundreds of ohms, probably thousands of ohms. So that's why it charges up and then drops slower and charges up real fast. But it manifests as noise, and you can see it here, it's real bad. And it's not even working. We're, we're barely getting anything above five volts in the first place, and we've added noise. And then if I keep going down and down, you can see my power supply is drawing a little more. Now we're below the supply. The waveform looks terrible. And if I turn it down even more, see we're starting to draw like 67 milliamps. And this, this, what is even this? This is just awfulness. And we're down to three volts. But take out the potentiometer, nice and clean again. And that is a 
transformerless, no transformer, square wave driven voltage doubler with two capacitors and two diodes. So on the 10 mega ohm oscilloscope probe, I was getting about 8.8 .8 volts using a 5 volt supply. Doubler would of course be 10 volts. The diodes drop some voltage, which limits the supply that anything even sees. Also, my timer doesn't put out the full 5 volts, it puts out about 4.3. So I could probably improve things a little bit by having a pull-up resistor on its output to help it reach the rail when it's high. Use the diodes that have the smallest voltage drop possible that still survive the reverse voltage so that they don't, you know, get goofed, you know, go into breakdown. And you can serve a bigger load by having bigger capacitors. I was using the biggest, I don't like using electrolytics. It's annoying to have to manage the polarity, so I always use ceramics, and ceramics aren't as big. It clearly works, but it has to be signal voltage. Now, just to point out, if you're like me and you don't have the larger capacitors, you can put capacitors in parallel, and that increases the capacitance. So you can always just use more parts to make a bigger capacitor. But there you go. So now you can have a 10 volt Arduino. You could even have a 100 volt Arduino if you wanted. Maybe I'll do that just for fun in the future. More videos coming eventually, in some order, who knows, on doing this with a transformer output instead of a square wave generator, doubling beyond doubling, increasing beyond doubling, and creating negative voltage. But for now, I'll be seeing you.